wasn't that something? The, uh, I don't know about you, with music like that, it, uh, sometimes I, I get tingles up my back, you know, because it's, uh, it's so inspiring, so inspiring. A, uh, it's, it's something that people get together and they put special effort, especially for the feast. And I'm so glad we have a calendar to know when the feast days are. And you think of the pictures they were showing there with, with the, uh, some of God's creation. When you think of the mind of God, it's quite, quite wonderful. Glad we have special music. Well, uh, looks like this is it for Zoom for a while. We can, we can enjoy, you know, each other's company on Zoom like this. It's been so useful, but it's going to, I think, be, it may be put on the back burner. I don't know. We may have another, you know, a spike in the COVID and we may have to do it again, but for now, we're going to go back to in-home in uh, or in-person services. The last time I spoke uh, here on Zoom, I talked about the Day of Atonement. In fact, the title of my message was The Day of Atonement is about cleansing. It was just before the Day of Atonement. It wasn't a, a, uh, a message on completely on the Day of Atonement. It was at taking a look at a different perspective of the Day of Atonement. Could you turn with me over to Levitia, Leviticus 16? There's a couple of scriptures I'd like to share with you over to Leviticus 16. And I'm going to be reading in the uh, English Standard Version for the, for the most part today. Like I said, my message wasn't a Day of Atonement message, but it was in preparation for it. Oftentimes on the Day of Atonement, we reread re Leviticus like 16.1. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And he said, and the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. He says, don't come at any time for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So it was, it was, uh, they, he was, God was telling them, be careful. You're only, you're not supposed to go all the time, but he, there was, he, they were supposed to go in one day a year, Leviticus, uh, 16, five. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel, two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And then we'll just keep reading a little bit here, a couple verses. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself, and he shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. But the, and Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement for over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. You know, Azazel is a, a, a name that it's, it's disputed about what it actually means. The cultural studies, uh, cultural background study Bible rather says, although still contested on many fronts, Azazel is likely to be a spirit being. So there's a lot of, there's controversy over that. Go to verse 15. It, it says, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its, its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull. Sprinkle it over the mercy seat and in front of the, in front of the mercy seat. You know, killing a goat or a ram, for that matter, or the bull even, would be messy. I remember living in a third world country. I've been to a number of countries in Asia, but I've lived in, a, as some of you know, in Nepal, north of India. And I remember them killing goats. 
and, and they would sacrifice the goat. They would sprinkle water on its head to get it to nod, to say that it was okay before they cut its throat. And then they'd have this big basin to catch the blood, okay? And you can imagine these people at, you know, in the time of the ancient Israelites catching the blood of a full grown bull and a, and a goat and a ram. It's messy. Go to verse 21, Leviticus 16, 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. Or you might, it might say, fit man in your Bible. That word fit or readiness, it's only used once in the Bible. You know, if you think about what was happening here with this ritual, this, what they were observing, it's pretty important with the millions, millions of people, how many people were in the congregation of Israel at that time in, in the, uh, the wilderness. And they're going to, they're going to put all the sins on the head of this goat and send it away. It's pretty important, quite important. And you know, if I was back, they probably did. I'd take a rope and tie it around the waist of this fit man. You wouldn't want him to let go. I mean, this this goat's got to go where it's supposed to go. Tie a rope maybe around the the, uh, the goat said. You'd want to be careful. The sins of the entire nation were on it. It's important. Leviticus 27. One more scripture here. Leviticus 27. It says... And the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned up with fire. It's enormous, you can imagine, enormous bonfire. They actually did this, burn these animals up. So why are we reading this? I'd like to stop and ask and answer a question here. What was this all about? You know, today, the Church of God understands that, that the goat for the wilderness represented Satan the devil, and that one day the sins of all mankind will pl be placed on him. He's the one that inspires people, and he'll be separated from mankind for a thousand years. And, and we also understand that the sacrifice goat represents Jesus Christ, who was sacrificed for us. I'd like to point out the fact at this point, and it applies to Christianity, our the way of life we follow. And the point I'd like to point out is this. They didn't understand the significance of what they were doing. You know, we look back and understand, but they just had to do what they were told. They had to trust and obey, do what they were told. They didn't understand what the ritual signified. You know, this type of action, if you think about it, happened to them and to other people in other places in the Bible. Daniel, he didn't understand everything, you know, when he was getting prophecies revealed to him. In Daniel 12, I'll just read it to you. It says, and I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. I think our time. Trust in God is part and parcel of the way of life we, we follow, whether or not we understand. But my uh, short message today, I'll be dealing with that one important facet of Christianity, trust in God. You know, sometimes we don't know how to trust in God or when to trust in God, but this mes message will deal with with both those decisions as well as reveal some biblical examples of people who did and didn't trust in God. The title of my message is Trust God and Reap the Rewards. Trust God and Reap the Rewards. And I'd like to approach this uh, subject in, with, with three major areas, points. First, we're going to take a look at, uh, we'll see how trust brings rewards. Trust brings rewards. 
blessings and church talk. And number two, we'll be taking a look at some biblical examples. Biblical examples, number two. And lastly, we'll talk about trust and us. So, number one, trust brings rewards. Number two, biblical examples. And lastly, number three, trust and us. So, trust brings rewards. And you know what trust is. You know, I could look up Hebrew words and give you numbers from Strong. But I'm, you know, it's what you put your confidence in. It's dependence on, you know. There's a number of Hebrew words. They all go back to confidence or dependence on something. Consider our money. I have here a $100 bill. You know, years ago, I probably would have had a $1 bill, but we have inflation, you know. On the back of this $100 bill, it says, in God we trust. You can probably see it there. In God we trust. And the, other, uh, the rest of our paper money has it too, the $1, the 5 the 20s. You know, most re we understand, we believe, I, I, you probably believe like I do. I don't think most, most people really trust God, but the majority of people. People do trust the money, right? You can get something with this. Because people trust in money, we can use it as an ex exchange. That's a blessing. That's a reward. That's a, a good thing. It's because people trust this. I can go down and buy gasoline, groceries, right? I can charge people and they'll pay me in this so I have a, a salary. It's a wonderful blessing. You know, the United States, I believe, was formed by people who did trust in God. And the United States of America has been wonderfully blessed because of trust, trust in God, and then trust in the money too, and then other trusts, you know, home ownership, consider it, just thinking about the idea of trust. The bank holds trust in the, in the debtor. You, you know, and we get the reward of a house. You wanna buy a house? You know, I didn't have enough money to buy the house I'm in right now. I had to get somebody to trust me and I had to prove that I could, you know, buy the, uh, make, make good my payments ahead of time. True trust in God brings many rewards. Over in Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. It, it, you read in verse 3, it says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. If you in, indeed trust in God, you will have peace. And that is a wonderful blessing. So few people have true peace. So trust in itself brings good things, rewards. Although you have to watch, or how, watch how you trust and what you put your trust in. And I'd like to go on to some, some biblical examples next. And I've got a good and bad examples here. If you could turn with me to um, 1 Samuel. You know, if you have a relationship with God, you'll trust him. And if you trust him, you'll obey him. And good things will happen. If you have a relationship with God, you'll trust him. And if you trust him, you'll obey him. Over in 1 Samuel 13, I'll just give you a little bit of background to the story. This was uh, Israel's first king, Saul. And the country was just starting out. It's on its way up, but they were having problems with people around them. The Philistines were attacking them, vicious people. They, you know, remember that the, the people asked for a king, so they got Saul. God originally started out as their king, but God was still working with them. And God had ordained a priesthood. And he had a special order of sacrifices like we just read about with the, uh, the Day of Atonement and ways that he wanted things done and ways not to do things. The special order of sacrifices, who was to perform them. And Samuel was the priest. And he was the one that was ordained to do sacrifices and asked for God's help, not Saul. But in verse, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, 6, it says, and the Philistines were attacking these people. 
when the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, they weren't winning. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some of Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They, they fled, they escaped. Saul, Saul was still at Gil, Gilad, Gilgal, excuse me. And all the people followed him trembling. Okay, so things aren't going good. But Samuel is set to come and offer sacrifices and pray to God for them. For God's intervention. So he was supposed, supposed to uh, come at a set time. Go down to verse 8. He waited seven days. This is Saul. The time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. Now, he wasn't supposed to do that, but his, what did get, uh, his human reasoning, maybe, well, you know, we got to get this done. He didn't, did he have a good relationship with God? No, I question that. If he would go ahead and do it. Let's, okay, go down to verse 13. So Samuel shows up. And he says to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. And because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Okay, so... He didn't trust in God. I don't think he had a good relationship with God. And he, he had, he's tricked by his own human reasoning. He succumbed and he didn't, what he, didn't do what he was supposed to do. What would you have done? Which, you know, what should he have done? If, if he didn't trust God to work out the situation. He knew what God required of him. And sometimes we, we think that we have to work everything out likewise. He didn't obey God, and he lost the reward. He let his human reasoning and fears get the best of him. You know, sometimes when you're at the end of the rope, you need to tie a knot to hang on. Consider what could have happened if he would have hung on, waited just a little while longer. He would have received reward for it. We can use his bad example. God gives us this wonderful book called the Bible with all these bad examples as well as good examples. We can use it just to do better. You know, in the church today, everyone is not a minister and their offices and set aside duties. You want to be careful to remember that today too. What about a good example of trusting God? Hezekiah, first, second Kings. Let's go over to second Kings and go to ver chapter 18, second Kings 18. Here's a guy that, that trusted God. 2 Kings 18, and go to verse 13. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Okay, here we got more invaders coming in, you know, giving Israel a hard time, or Judah a uh, hard time, being, you know, attacking them. This is hundreds of years after the last verse we read with uh, Saul. That Sennacherib was a formidable foe. Second Kings, go to verse chapter 19 and verse 14. Second Kings 19, 14. We're going to fast forward through a little few scriptures. So Sennacherib, he, uh, Hezekiah got a letter of what Sennacherib was intending. And Sennacherib came up and he and he talked to the people, they were behind the wall in <clears throat> Jerusalem. And he tried to persuade them. He said, in a nutshell, trust me, you can trust me. I'm going to take you people to a, a nice land and give you farms and houses better than you have. But I'm so big, I'm going to overtake you anyway. Trust, anyway, trust me. So Hezekiah didn't trust him. Trust in man, you know, that's kind of dangerous. <clears throat> Chapter four, uh, 19, verse 14. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah 
went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He said, These, they're going to attack me. They're going to attack our country. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands. They did. They were, they were powerful invaders. They were conquerors and have cast their gods into the ground, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. They, they devastated their gods too, as they, for the countries they invaded. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. He didn't know what else to do. So he appealed for help for a miracle and he trusted God rather than the man. He didn't trust the Assyrian king. Good for him. I believe Hezekiah had a relationship with God. He prayed, right? So he trusted God, not man. In the good, it turned out good for him. And we have the story here in the Bible for us. When you have a Sennacherib in your own life, I've had him in mine, I'll tell you, and I think all of us Christians have them uh, sooner or later. You know what I mean, a Sennacherib. Trust God. <clears throat> you know, many years ago, uh, at a time, the Worldwide Church of God, I was part of the Worldwide Church of God for many years. It was... Uh, it was loosening guidance about the various aspects of uh, holy day observance, clean and unclean meats and things like that, Sabbath day. There was a young single lady at it that I knew and she had a young son, she, she was a single mom and she got this job and it wasn't a good time to get jobs and she was just hanging on to her job. It was only part-time, temporary, but she needed this job in the worst way. And the re job required her to work part day on Saturday. And like I said, she needed the job badly. And this was a toehold job where she could get a permanent job and uh, with, a, with a large corporation. That's what people want, security, a large corporation. And she was going to get a permanent job, you know, and she was a single mom. So she was in a, in a dire strait, Sennacherib. They said they're going to get rid of her. If they, you know, if she didn't work on the, you know, Saturday, they had it. It was, it was part of the agreement. She couldn't sue them as we see people sue today. She needed the job. And all she had to do was work part of the day on Saturday. She decided to bend the rules instead of trusting and obeying God. And she didn't continue observing or attending services for long. I never saw her again. But what could have happened if she would have trust God, you know, taken that job, you know, I mean, let the job, we said, I can't work on Saturday, do whatever, and they fire her. Okay, there's a million and one jobs out there God can give you, you know, can give you one better than you have now, if you decide to obey and trust him. I think I, I've got a, a thousand years of work to do, one pair of hands, there's so much work out there. She could have lost the job, for example, got a better one. Uh, she could have continued attending services. You know, I'm just imagining here, you know, found the, the, uh, the perfect mate and, and let him go to work and she could have been a mom. Who knows what good things could have happened. I'd like to point out difficult economic times are certain to come. We want to trust God and be patient. Not like Saul and his sacrifice. You, you can't work it all out yourself. And remember, these biblical examples are for us. Let's take a look at one, one New Testament example. Go to Matthew. Matthew 26, 36. This is a good example for us. Jesus is our example, right? Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. 
And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Then he had the simple prayer. He prayed it three times. I'm going, and he says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. He trusted God no matter what happened. And the worst happened. But if God leads you to something, he'll lead, he'll lead you through it. Look what a wonderful outcome happens for all of us since Jesus gave us the perfect example of complete trust in God. We get the hope of eternal life, resurrection from the dead, this way of life we're following. You know, there's a, there's examples of other people who trusted in God um, over in Hebrews chapter 11. Read it. It's called it the, the faith chapter. And, but trust in God is part and parcel of this way of life. But it can be blurred if you don't watch out. It's, and trusting God's going to make all the difference in the time just ahead of us. And that leads me to the last area I'd like to talk about. And, and that's you and me today. But I'd like to reiterate, if you have a relationship with God, you'll trust him. And if you trust him, you'll obey him. You know, what are some special times when we need to trust God? I'll give you a couple here. When things aren't going well in your life. Remember, God has the big picture in mind and he's, he's working in, in, in each of us to develop us. It's not about how much you accumulate in life. It's, it's about what you become after God does his work in you. Developing character takes time and circumstances. As I've heard recently, diamonds are created under intense heat and pressure. Trials do that spiritually. Another special time when you want to trust God is when you have to obey God, but the outcome doesn't look good. You can see the outcome coming. You know, Daniel's three friends, that's a good one. They could see that the fiery furnace is right there. You got to trust God. I'll give you one more. <clears throat> when you're at your wit's ends to fix the problem or situation, and it's just too big for you, like Sennacherib and Hezekiah. Hezekiah was powerless. He was, you know, Sennacherib, Sennacherib had uh, soldiers like the sand on the seashore. He just was at his wit's end. Okay, lastly, are there times when you shouldn't trust God? Wow, did I just say that? Yeah. I'll say no, but God wants us to be responsible, and we are being trained to be doers and leaders and not just uh, observers. You, you don't want the pilot <clears throat> flying your airliner if you take a flight to Chicago not to know what he's, they're doing and they're just trusting God that it'll all work out. You want him to know what he's doing. You want the people driving cars out there to know what they're doing. You know, we, people, the point is people can become superstitious. We can become superstitious. You don't want to go that way regarding trust in God. Work as if it all depends on you and pray as if it all depends on God. That's a good one. I'm just going to quote you Ecclesiastes 9, 10, and winding this message up. <clears throat> Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, the grave, to which you're going. Young people, you want to work hard and develop skills that can serve others so you can have a good job. Okay, what's the takeaway for us today? Okay, we've seen how trust brings rewards. Trust itself brings rewards. It's a, something about uh, trust. We've taken a look at a few biblical examples, good and bad, and we've seen how our trust in God can affect us personally. If you have a relationship with God, you'll trust him. If you trust him, you'll obey him, whether or not you have all the understanding you desire. And sometimes we just don't understand. You know, um, remember, you know, the people dealing with the Day of Atonement, Thousands of years ago, the ancient Israelites and the sacrifice, they didn't know exactly what all they were doing. They didn't see the end from the beginning. They were just doing what they were told. Sometimes we want to do that. It's true with us. 
the other night, Terry and I, are, Terry and I were watching an Our Planet movie on Netflix. It's, uh, it's a documentary about our, our, the natural wonders of the world we live in. And it documented the European butterfly, a European butterfly life cycle. They had a name for it. But these delicate butterflies laid eggs on a foliage above the ground. And on the ground, there were these ferocious ants that would eat the eggs, you know, if, if one fell, fell to the ground. Okay, so they, they showed the eggs develop into larvae safe from the, uh, the ants. And amazingly, the larvae grows up, it turns into a worm, and it spins down. It's like a spider's web. It lowers itself on a rope to the ground. And the ants come running and grab it, and they take it underground to their nest. You think, oh, this thing's going to get eaten. You know, this poor larvae, they don't want to see ants eat it. Well, anyway, it's a wonder this larvae emits a sound and a smell that fool the ants, and the ants think it's a queen. So they start feeding it, believe it or not, feeding this larvae. The thing gets fat, grows fat, and then it hibernates for something like 22 months. And then it comes out of the, the, uh, uh, the, the ants underground uh, tomb there and climbs up on something, turns into a butterfly. <laughs> you know, Paul likens spiritual growth to a planted seed. The end product does not look like the seed. In a like manner, as we trust God, holding steadfast to, to his commandments and his statutes, we develop into special people, creations of God. What the end product of each of us will be is yet to be seen. So trust God and reap the rewards.